Well, it is good to be here tonight. I want to welcome everybody. We're going to continue in our study. I need to kind of hit the ground running tonight because we have a lot of ground to cover. But we're continuing our study, uh, Life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. Now, just by way of review, I uh, want to uh, just quickly look at some of the things that we have talked about uh, up to this point. And first of all, we talked about Adam, of course, in the Garden of Eden, uh, the fact that God was with him, and, of course, later on when God manifested himself in the temple, um, that God was with the people, but that at Pentecost, things changed, and God moved out, if you will, of uh, just being with people and in to man. And this was the great promise that God had made to man, uh, that he would send his Holy Spirit that would live inside of us. Um, he would write his laws in our hearts and minds, and it would uh, be a watershed event in the history of humanity. And um, we've kind of touched upon those things, so I just want to bring that before your mind as we're uh, moving forward. Now, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit was poured out, and there are four pictures that we see uh, throughout the scriptures that sort of give us an idea of what uh, is happening. And first of all, the first picture is the wind of the Spirit, and we talked about that last week. And this week we're going to talk about the holy fire or the fire of God, which is really one of my favorite topics because for one I think it's one of the most misunderstood topics uh, that is usually addressed. So I just hope tonight and pray that the Lord would give us insight into what exactly is the fire of God. Then thirdly we're going to talk about the holy anointing oil or the anointing uh, that God gives, and then finally we'll talk about the living water um, that the Lord has provided, of course, and we will deal with that in the weeks to come. But I've entitled this particular session tonight, The Fire of the Holy Spirit. The Fire of the Holy Spirit. When you think about the fire of God, maybe some people think about God's judgment, Maybe some think about God's presence, okay? And many things come to mind. If you, if you talk about Pentecostal folks, especially back in the old days, um, they talked about the fire. Sometimes people meant it in a sense of excitement, uh, religious excitement. Uh, they may say something like, you know, that person was really on fire for God. And I like that kind of language. Maybe they would say something like, you know, there was a little wildfire that erupted in the service. I mean, uh, this is the type of thing. But I want to address this topic tonight as, as clearly as we can in the time that we have, because I believe that if you uh, rightly understand what the fire of God is, it will fill in the blanks to so many passages of Scripture going all the way back into the Old Testament. You would be surprised. I told someone this morning, I said, when I feel like the Lord had shown me a revelation uh, in the scriptures of what the fire of God truly is, I was able to populate an enormous amount of, of information into uh, my understanding of the scriptures. And I just want to begin tonight, Matthew chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, and then we're going to read another passage after this. Of course, this is John the Baptist speaking. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay? So Jesus is the great baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay, so there are many things we could talk about in that second uh, passage there, but I want you to just focus for a minute that Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then secondly, 
Luke chapter 12, verses 49 to 52. Jesus is speaking here. He said, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened until it is accomplished. Suppose you that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I tell you, I have not come to bring peace, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, and two against three. When a person gets on fire for God, and they begin to burn for the Lord, that brings a tremendous division into any kind of relationship because people typically can handle a nominal Christian. How many of you know what I mean tonight? Yeah. They can handle being, a nominal, uh, being around a nominal Christian, but if you get on fire for God, you begin to burn for God, you begin to live for the Lord in a radical kind of way, okay, this will begin to bring division in a house. And I said uh, at the bottom here, I said, the fire of God in the life of a believer will bring the division that Jesus speaks of in these verses. Dead religion rarely, okay, rarely causes trouble among, among friends and family. Again, if you're just sort of a nominal Christian, you're a Christian in name only, you don't take Christianity very seriously, then you probably aren't going to have a whole lot of trouble. Again, you get on fire for God, and it's going to bring division. Now, I want to go back for a, for a little while into the Old Testament, and I want to talk about the fire of God and the revelation that God has brought to us uh, through some key events that took place that we know of, uh, going all the way back, at least until the time of the children of Israel in Egypt. You'll remember that Egypt... Okay, the children of Israel were there for 400 years. God was going to lead them out of Egypt. Okay, and Egypt was a type of this present evil world. Pharaoh was a type of the devil. Okay, and God wanted to call the people out. Okay, that they could go and worship him. They were going to call them out into um, the land or the promised land. But, of course, God appeared to Moses on the backside of the desert, and he appeared uh, in a burning bush that burned but wasn't consumed. Keep that picture in your mind. Burning but not consumed, because this is going to translate over later into Romans chapter 12. Okay, So keep that idea in mind. But God began to reveal himself to Moses as a God that is a God of fire. The book of Hebrews tells us that God is a consuming fire. So what happened? God led the children of Israel by the hand of Moses out of Egypt. Why did he do that? Because God will not accept offerings from the people while they're still in sin. Okay? You have to come out of the world. You have to come out of sin, okay, into a place of consecration before God will really accept the offerings that you have. God wasn't going to be worshipped and served in Egypt. He called the people out, okay, into his promised land. And then secondly, God would not enter into a covenant with the people and dwell among them unless they agreed to obey Him. And this I suggest, as others have in the past, that this is one of the key hang-ups for why people never truly know the manifest presence of God in their life. They have not yet, in the language of Paul, obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered them. I remember as a young Christian uh, trying to understand Christianity. I had been brought to church, of course, on the church bus. I had uh, been in a lot of Sunday school classes. I'd heard a lot of sermons. But when it came to understanding what God really required of me, I didn't really realize it. But circumstances happened that 
I was able to spend some time where God had gotten complete control, uh, uh, really, I, I should say, my, com my undivided attention, okay, through some circumstances that had happened at my work. I'd gotten injured on the job, and I was pretty much, uh, in one sense, incapacitated. So God got my undivided attention. I began to study and read God's Word, and it didn't take me very long to realize that what God was trying to do was establish his authority in my life, okay? Just like at the children of Israel. Imagine the scene. Here's the mountain. It's burning with fire, okay? And you have uh, only a select number of people that were able to go. Everyone else was completely forbidden. Why? Because God is holy, and God can't just be approached, okay? He cannot dwell among sinful people. And he wanted to come down from the mountain, if you will, and dwell among the people. All right? But in order to do that, he had to first of all give them an agreement or a covenant so that they would recognize what was required of them. And, of course, as you know the story, while on the mountain, God showed Moses a picture of the heavenly temple. And he said, I want you to go down and make a replica of that, if you will, down on the land. And what's going to happen is I'm going to come down off the mountain and I'm going to dwell in that tabernacle, which is basically a mobile palace. I'm going to dwell in that tabernacle. There's going to be an agreement between, between me and the people. And if you will agree, if you will live by the terms of this covenant, then I will come and dwell among you. You know the story? Moses took the covenant, okay? And he took the blood, he sprinkled the covenant, and the people said all of these things would they do, that they were going to be obedient, okay? And once that was in place, once they had determined we're going to obey God, we're going to be under His authority, then God moved down, if you will, among the people. And I just want to continue with this uh, line of thought tonight, because it is very, very powerful. Now, when God moved down to the wilderness tabernacle, okay, if we could just get over there, you will notice this is the tabernacle. It's just sort of an artist's rendition. Everybody's tent is pitched towards the tabernacle. Um, the first thing that the people saw when they got out in the middle of the night was the fire, which represented the manifest presence of God, okay? And here was the tabernacle, which was God's palace. The Holy of Holies was sort of like His throne room. The Ark of the Covenant was like His throne. And any time that the people, okay, uh, broke the covenant, any time there was an issue, that covenant had to be serviced. Uh, in other words, there had to be a way to right the wrong. Otherwise, God's presence would either have to leave or he would have to bring judgment. So that's why you have what came to be known as the temple cultus. This is basically just the sacrificial system that through the shedding of blood, people's sins could be forgiven, this covenant could be serviced, and God could remain. Okay, And there are many things I could say along that line. But... When it, came, when it came to worshiping the Lord in particular, when it came to doing His service, there is an aspect of this that is frequently overlooked that is vital to understanding not just the Old Covenant but the New. And that is that God wanted His service done with His holy fire. Okay? If you look to the left there, you will see... Uh, sort of a glow there inside that, um, sort of like inside that fencing area there. There's a glow to the left that would be the altar. And that altar burned, not with just any old fire, but with the fire of God. The fire of God fell from heaven to sort of dedicate this temple. Once that fire was started inside of that altar, it was the job of the priests to make sure that from that day forward, that fire never went out. Because if that fire went out, they could not do the service of God. 
You couldn't light a, ma a, a match. You couldn't pull out the lighter, right? You couldn't get a torch. You couldn't rub two sticks together. You had to use God's fire mm -hmm. for God's service. Amen. Okay? Do you, do you have that point? Keep that clear in your thinking as we're moving forward. God's service must be done with God's fire. Again, the Ark of the Covenant towards the left inside this. This is sort of like an overhead view. If we could you know, get up in a helicopter and sort of look straight down into this tabernacle, this is what it would look like, the layout. And to the left, of course, is the Ark. If you look towards the top inside the holy places, which is that compartment to the right, that would be the table of shoe bread. Straight across from it would be the candelabra or the lampstand. Uh, sometimes it's called a candlestick, but how many of you know in the Bible days they didn't have candles, right? They're made out of wax or, or congealed fat, okay? So they didn't have candles. They were lamps. They were little oil lamps, okay? And these little oil lamps had a wick, and they had oil, and they would light them, and they would burn again. Not with just any old fire. They didn't pull something out of their pocket and light it. They went out to the altar and got God's fire, and they lit it inside of here. As a matter of fact, the bread, as I understand it, uh, the, the, the loaves that were on top of the, of the table there were even cooked or baked with the fire of God. When you go to the altar of incense to the left, which is right before the veil, that is also where uh, you had the service that was taking place as well. But I want you to understand something about this picture uh, of this wilderness tabernacle here. When a priest would start from the right to the left, moving his way into the tabernacle, starting at the altar, goes to the brazen laver, that's your second arrow, right to left, then he goes into the holy place through the third arrow into that area all the way up to the front on the, on the holiest, uh, on the day of uh, atonement he would go in to the holiest of all, the holy of holies through the veil and once a year offer a sacrifice. But there is a sense in which as the priest is walking he has a sense that he is ascending. So if we could turn that up like this, okay? Imagine it's like the things that are in the holy place are the earthly things, okay? That's a picture of the earth. It's the candlestick or the lampstand on the earth. It's the altar of incense on the earth. It's the table of shoe bread on the earth. And then there's the veil. And then there's the throne. So the picture is that you have a barrier between you and the throne of grace. There is a barrier. You have cherubim that have been embroidered into this veil that's four inches thick woven of one seam. So here is this barrier that you cannot penetrate, okay, to get to God. You see that picture? You can't get to God. But how many of you know that when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn from top to bottom, which was an expression of the tearing of the body of Jesus, okay? So we go into the presence of God now through the torn veil, that is to say, His flesh. That is the means by which we approach God. But all of the service of God, okay, in, the, in this picture has to be done with the fire of God. And I just want to say a few more things about that tonight. When the priest would offer incense, it wasn't just incense. How many of you know it wasn't Chanel number no. 5? It wasn't the cologne I have at home. This was a special recipe that God had given them uniquely for His purposes. Now, for those of you who are familiar with your Bible, fast forward to the book of Revelation, and we understand that this was all this time a picture of the offering up of the prayers of the saints. This is a picture of this, the prayers being offered up. And I want to use a, a, a term here that I hope really sinks down into your ears. This offering was to be a sweet-smelling savor 
in the nostrils of God. You see that? In order for that to be true, two conditions had to be right. It had to be God's unique, okay, substance that is being offered as incense. It's his own recipe, his holy recipe. No one else could have it. It was against the law, biblically, to have this except for the service of God. The second thing is it has to be offered with the fire of God. So you see those two elements. If you were to bring common fire and it was to be offered, even though it was the right substance, it wouldn't be acceptable to God. If it was the wrong substance, but it was the fire of God, it still wouldn't be accepted. It has to be both. Follow back just a little ways. Uh, if you go back, let me see if I have a picture of it coming up. I don't. If you'll remember early on, I talked about one of the first places you arrive is at the altar where the fire was never to go out. That was also the place where they would do the burnt offering. A burnt offering was where you took an animal, okay, that was holy and acceptable unto God. It was a spotless lamb. You weren't to, of course, sacrifice it and then eat part of it like they did at Passover. How many of you remember they didn't just burn everything up? They went in and had dinner, Right? They ate this thing, which was common with the sacrifices. But the whole burnt offering was different. It was going to be completely consumed on the altar until there was nothing left. How many of you know that's when something's been completely given to God? Until there's nothing but ashes left. But in order for this sacrifice to be acceptable unto God, again... To be a sweet-smelling savor in his nostrils, two things had to be present. You had to have a holy and acceptable offering. How many of you remember in the book of Malachi, and, and some of the prophets came later and talked about, you know, bringing these offerings to God that are halt and maimed? I mean, they weren't. I mean, it's like instead of bringing the best, you went and got the worst, right? And, and then you try to offer that to the Lord, and then wonder why God wasn't accepting it. See. He wanted a spotless animal. He wanted an animal that was holy and, 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 and perfect, if you will, acceptable unto God. And then that offering was to be offered with the fire of God. Okay? And when it went up into his nostrils as it burned, it was like a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. Okay? And this is a picture, of course, again, of us giving our bodies to the Lord. Okay, Romans 12, verse 1 and following. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Some translate it spiritual worship. I translate it is the only thing that makes sense based upon what God has done for you through salvation. We present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Now I want to just point something out, and that is that there were a couple of characters, if you will, in the scriptures that have kind of became infamous over time by the name of Nadab and Abihu, okay? How many of you remember those guys? Apparently, of course, these were the sons of Aaron. If you look at the context of what happened, they were intoxicated and decided to offer to the Lord strange fire. How many of you remember what happened? Hmm? The fire of God came out and consumed them. All right? Now, you say, wow, what could have been so serious that God would have consumed these men for what they did. All they did was just at, you know, offer some common fire to the Lord. Well, it was serious enough that Aaron wasn't even allowed to grieve his own son's death. As a matter of fact, God said to bewail the fire that God kindled. In my mind, what God is saying is, focus on the fact 
that throughout the rest of history, and God knew and knows how long history is going to be, He is setting forth a pattern of how He is to be worshipped, how He is to be served, how He is to be treated in the earth for all times. And at that moment, these guys are going to try to innovate and insert strange fire into the service. And it wasn't acceptable to God. No, God doesn't strike everyone dead when they do something like that. But I heard a preacher say something one time, and I never forgot it. He said he doesn't have to strike everyone dead. He doesn't have to strike dead every Ananias and Sapphira. He said because if he does it just one time, that is his estimate of the behavior for all times. In other words, God's showing you in that one event how he feels about the behavior. He doesn't have to do it again. He's already shown you. And that is the seriousness of it. So they're going to try to offer strange fire to the Lord. Now I want to fast forward real quick. You know, as time went on, things started to go bad in Israel in the time of the judges. We reached the family of Eli, who was the high priest. And what does the scripture say? That the lamp of the Lord, before the lamp of the Lord went out, okay, that's vital to keep in your mind, that God spoke to Samuel, okay, and he told Samuel that he's going to judge the house of Eli. What ended up happening? Hophni and Phinehas, why does it seem like they always come in pairs? Anybody still with me? Hophni and Phinehas, uh-huh. Nadab and Abihu, Johnnies and Jambres, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like they're partnering in crime. Yeah. And these are two boys that their father refused to bring in check. Mm. They were fornicating with the girls at the church, if you will. They were doing things to cause the people to despise the offering of God. And not only that, they had a reckless attitude towards the holy things of God. The Bible called them children of Baal, or, or they did not know the Lord. Okay, They weren't even saved. So what happened? The Philistines are attacking. They grab the ark up, they grab it, and they run into battle with it. That is unthinkable, isn't it? Could you imagine the madness of that? Could you imagine if you were the high priest how your heart would have nearly stopped watching them boys running into battle. Guess what happened? Philistines stopped them, destroyed them, killed them, took the ark. And at the same time, I suggest, not only did they lose the ark, but the fire of God went out. Now there's a big problem. We don't have the ark, and we don't have the fire. We can't do the service of God. We know what happened. Of course, eventually some bad things happened to the people who took the ark. Amen. We won't get into those here. I'll let you read about that. Really, almost comical stuff, but it was bad. But nevertheless, David, through a process of time and many events, brought the ark of God back into the city. Solomon built God a house because God said David can't build it. He's a man of blood. Solomon, a word that means shalom, Solomon built the house. What ended up happening? After it was built, this magnificent place, here is Solomon bringing in all of these sacrifices, getting ready to dedicate this new temple. I mean, he's bringing them in by the thousands. I mean, he just keeps bringing them and bringing them. I've said it in the past. I wonder if somebody said, Solomon, listen, isn't that enough? I mean, how many thousands do you have to have? I mean, it's like Armageddon out here. Right? But he said, no, keep bringing them. Keep bringing them. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because he understood the altar. Yes. He understood that when the altar is truly full, that God will move. Yes, amen. So he said, keep bringing them. Say, well, that's reckless devotion. No, no. Keep bringing it. What happened? 
Some events happened, some things. God started to manifest His glory inside the temple. Solomon gets up and he prays. When he had made an end to praying, the Bible said that the fire of God came down, consumed the sacrifice. The glory of God filled the house of God until the priests were not able to stand to minister. Think of how powerful that is. Utterly glorified. Mm -hmm. That house was utterly glorified. Do you see Pentecost when you think of that? Do you think of the day of Pentecost? Utterly glorified. The fire of God has come. Think of the awesomeness of this. But what happened? As we know, again, the children of Israel, things went bad for them. Eventually, God's presence lifted off the temple again. And when it did, God had already said, If you guys do not serve me, you do not obey me, I will destroy this place. Nebuchadnezzar came in, completely destroyed that temple. They went into captivity 70 years. They were sent back into the city to build it up again after the 70 years was over, they built what came to be known as Zerubbabel's temple, which when the old timers seen it, they wept because they were like, well, this sure isn't what we've seen before. But it was better than nothing, right? We don't have any record of God's presence ever being there or the fire of God ever being there. The ark of God had passed into legend at this point. And from this point forward, there would be no ark. So what happened? Well, over time, over time, what happened? I'm a little bit behind on my slides. But what ended up happening? I'll tell you what happened. The Romans came and they built up Zerubbabel's temple to become the magnificent place that it was in the time of Jesus. But nevertheless, nevertheless, what happened? Jesus, when he came, he told The people, watch this, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. How many of you remember that? Mm -hmm. Destroy this temple. Now they thought he was talking about the big temple. He's like, you know, what, 40 odd years they've been building this thing. You're going to raise it up in three days. See, but he was talking about the temple of his body. You see, when Jesus walked the earth, he was the temple of the Holy Spirit. He was the place... Watch this, from which the fire of God could be found. He was the place from which the voice of God emanated. He was the oracle. He was everything that God had sort of intended the priesthood to be prior to that. He intended the priests to be the teachers, to be the ones who communicated God's will to the people. But so oftentimes they fell into sin. Okay? So when Jesus comes along who is about to be anointed in a short period of time to be our great high priest, he is teaching the people. He is showing them the ways of God, not just in word, but in deed and in action, okay? But he said, destroy this temple, okay? And I will build it again in three days. When he went in and he ran out the money changers one time, you remember that? He said something to the the effect, my father's house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But you'll remember later on when he's reaching towards the end of his ministry, he refers to their temple, and you can check this out. He said, your house is left unto you desolate. Not God's house. Now it's your house. And what ended up happening? Of course, Jesus died on the cross. Later on, it was within 35 years, the Roman armies came, Titus, 1st Vespasian, then Titus totally wiped out the temple. The only thing that's left today is part of a wall, they call it the Wailing Wall, that as I understand it, when they tore the rocks down, when they put them back, they put them in reverse order. The top's at the bottom, the bottom's at the top, because when they found it, it was all, just like Jesus said, not one stone was left upon another. That's how serious that was. So... What ended up happening? They go into the upper room. They go into the upper room. They began to pray. The fire of God fell upon the people. Cloven tongues as a fire appeared over the top of them. When you see pictures of that, my mind immediately cross-references the wilderness tabernacle. 
where the fire would lead the people by night and the cloud by day. How many remember that? It's being led of the Holy Spirit. It's a picture that the person individually is being led of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture said, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You see, what happened was centuries of going through the motions, going through this priesthood, putting on the priestly garb, going through all of the processes, the high priest, going into the temple and making sure that the lamp was burning, making sure the wicks were good, making sure the oil was full, making sure the fire never went out, okay? Doing the service of God. I sometimes say to people, I said, if there was any place on earth where God's will should have been being done like it is in heaven, it was in that tabernacle. Mm -hmm. It was in that temple. Because that was a little piece of heaven on earth. You couldn't go in and innovate. Oh, we're going to move some things around. Not in that place. Right? We're going to change up the decor. You see, God's will was to be done in that place. And that was a picture of the way God wanted things to be everywhere. Not just in the temple. But keep in mind, all of these things are pictures for us. I want to read two passages of Scripture to you, just real quickly. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now these things, what did he say? Happened to them for an example, but they are written down for our instruction, okay, of whom... The end of the ages has come. 1 Corinthians, again, verse chapter 10, verse 11. So God recorded all of this information to teach us about ourselves. When you get to 1 Corinthians, Paul is telling the people, Do you not know? And understand that any time Paul says, Do you not know? There's a good chance that people don't know. They're not thinking about it. Mm-hmm. They don't realize it. It hasn't really sunk in. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He warned them about using their body for fornication, taking their members and yielding them as as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. If you think about your body in the same consecrated sense as you would think about the wilderness tabernacle and the temple and the Ark of the Covenant and all of those holy things, I think it would change the way we view the way we live. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your spirit and your body, which are God's. We've been redeemed. We've been bought. Now I just want to say this, and then hopefully we can take these things up because I'm almost out of time. In the book of Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is moving in his role as the great high priest. Of course, Aaron was only a type of that. Eli was only a type of that. Jesus is the reality. He is moving among the lampstands that are burning. He happens upon happens upon the first one, the church at Ephesus. He tells them many great things they're doing, but he said, I have something against you because you have left your first love. He said, repent and do the works you did at first, or I will move your lampstand, remove it out of its place. And it was that revelation of of story that God used to spark my mind to understand what is the fire of God. And I submit to you tonight that it is when the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by God. The Holy Spirit. That's the simplicity of it. When the love of God becomes the burning motivation for your life. You see that? When that becomes the burning motivation of your life. When you begin to love like God loves. When you begin to see people with the eyes of fire. That is the eyes of holy love. That God looks compassionately. The Lord Jesus looks and he sees. 
Think about all of the passages through Scripture that suddenly make sense if you insert this fact into there. What is fire? It is a light source. What is love? It is a light source. What did the Bible tell you about hatred? If any man hates his brother, he walks in darkness. If a person is stingy or they have an evil eye, okay, if their eye is evil, their whole body will be full of darkness. Why is that? You're looking not with love. You're looking with greed. You're moving in non-love. So it's darkness. Think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, it profits me nothing. In other words, God does not accept offerings, can I say it like this to you, that we make that are not done out of love. Some preach Christ out of envy and strife, but the other of love. Which one do you think God accepts? Which one do you think is in His mind an offering that is acceptable unto the Lord? And I just want to close with this last couple of thoughts tonight. Again, Paul in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, tells us to present our bodies. He wants us to be a walking, living, breathing, burnt offering. So that our whole life, watch this, becomes in the nostrils of God, a sweet-smelling savor. Our whole life. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, And you also as living stones are being built up into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. How do you do that? By doing things in love. What good does it do things and not be motivated by the love of God? It doesn't profit you anything. That is what Paul tells us. Through Him, let us therefore offer continually up to God the sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Watch this, for what sacrifices are well-pleasing to God. What happens when we give out of love it is an acceptable offering and sacrifice to God. It is just as though something was offered up with the fire of God. And finally, Philippians 4 verse 18. But I have all, I am abounding, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Why was it acceptable? I submit to you, it's because it was offered, if you will, upon an altar with the fire of the love of God. Jesus told the Ephesians, I'll take away your lampstand. Why? Because you know what? If we had a lamp in the middle of this room and it was nothing but darkness and there was no fire on that thing, it would just be one more thing to stumble over in a darkened room. But what happens? When we are burning for God, when we are burning with the love of God, the light of the Gospel, the light of Jesus Christ, the light that we need to emanate when we're preaching, okay, the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts and then radiating out in the form of light that illuminates. Okay, Jesus said... I wouldn't light a lamp and hide it under a bed, hide it under a bushel. What is that? Again, the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. I just want to close in prayer tonight. I just want to close in prayer. Lord, we are just so grateful tonight to consider these great thoughts that, Lord, You would come and live in man, that the fire of Your Holy Spirit the very love of God, the very motivating influence, the very driving force, the very thing for which we would burn for and live for, Lord, inside of us. Lord, it's my prayer tonight that if we are like the Ephesian church, that we've moved away or left the love that we had at first, that, Lord, we would go back, retrace our steps, 
repent and renounce the things that are challenging the love of God in our lives so that we can be effective ministers, ministering sacrifices, if you will, that are well-pleasing to you, sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God because the offering is acceptable and that we are moving in the fire of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just give thanks tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.